Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here. I was feeling actually a little bit guilty after Bob Sanford's comments this morning that the oil sands suck all, all the air out of the room. Uh, but the fact that we're all here just really shows uh, how much Albertans do care about how this resource is managed. I've lived in Alberta about 13 years now, and I certainly care about how the oil sands is developed and, and, and at what pace. Um, so thank you very much for, for taking part in this talk. And you know, it's been a long day, and I'm saying between you and your, your first beer, or a walk around a uh, beautiful bath. So I won't be, you know, in, in the 30 minutes I have, I'll only be touching on the uh, high-level policy angle with regards to water use, quality, etc. cetera. Uh, so um, I do aspire to have time for questions as well. So just a little bit about the Pemina Institute. I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with our roots. We started here in Alberta in 1985, but we're now a national organization with offices across the country, have about 55 staff. <laughs> And we work on oil sands, but we also work on climate change, uh, the issues around transportation, and renewable energy and energy efficiency. <coughs> when it comes to oil sands, we're proud to say that we are we are an Ango. We heard a little bit of banter about Angos this morning. So the, an environmental uh, non-governmental organization who's actually got about almost 20 years now of experience on the oil sands file. Um, we've been a participant in a number of different multi-stakeholder organizations, and Alberta loves their all these stakeholder groups, and uh, we've taken part fully in many of them. We're still a member of the Wood Buffalo Environmental Association, WOODBIA, as well as, oh dear, as well as the uh, Oil Sands Environmental Coalition, which is a coalition of three, three organizations here in Alberta. Uh, we've in the past forged bilateral negotiations with companies, and we have participated <coughs> in public hearings, one of our more public, I guess, opportunities for, for uh, advancing solutions and making recommendations to mitigate impacts. Um, we actually do consulting with oil sands companies to try to uh, advance solutions within the confines of a project. And our research um, is fairly popular. We've produced a number of different uh, reports on the environmental impacts of oil sands development, about 60,000 downloads in uh, 2011. So it, we are a responsible oil sands development organization. We want to see, um, actually it's been interesting uh, how, how um, frequently that term has been thrown around of late, particularly with the release of last week's budget. Um, so we're hearing a lot about responsible oil sands development. And, and you know we've been using it for a number of years now, but we always have been able to define what we mean. And that is that the current environmental impacts be addressed, so whether it be addressing the legacy towns that are on the landscape today, or ensuring that we have um, adequate environmental management system in place to protect wetlands, etc. We want to see science-based environmental limits put in place and that future development uh, respect those limits. And then we recognize the magnitude of this opportunity, um, not only for Alberta but for Canada. So taking a portion of the revenues and the benefits that come from the development of this resource to help Canada uh, diversify its energy economy, Alberta as well, <laughs> and ensure that we are competitive in the future is definitely a part of our our definition of responsible oil sands development. So today I'm going to talk about some, some challenges when it comes to water, uh, water use, water quality in the oil sands. Um, and then I'll talk about some solutions, and then hopefully we will have some time for questions. Just a little bit of a context, uh, I'm sure everyone in this room is well versed on, on how this resource is being extracted. We've got um, about 20% of the deposit uh, being surface mineable and uh, which is about 3% of the area. You'll also hear that figure thrown around. And then we've got the deeper deposits, which occupy a much larger area um, that are you know, most commonly developed using steam-assisted gravity drainage, or traditionally in the older days, uh, uh, CSS, uh, cyclic steam stimulation. And actually, it's been very interesting to me. I've been working now with Pemina for about five years now. Um, I took a year to go to the Arctic to uh, work on different issues to get a different bit of a different perspective. Returned to Alberta in, in 2010, and it's been interesting to me that lately I've been getting a lot of questions from people who are visiting from out of out of uh, country, um, particularly from the U.S. and in Europe, saying, "Well, why so why do you care? Why why should we care about this about this region and, and this resource? And you know, aren't the benefits much larger than than the uh, than the actual costs? And and so I think you know we don't have to reiterate what we've already heard today by Connie and others, but. We know that there are a number of First Nations that rely on this region for traditional land uses. And we know it occupies about 20% of our province. And, and this is a picture of the, the peak Athabasca Delta, so about a 6,000 square kilometer complex of uh, lakes, about 1,000 lakes. 
Um, <clears throat> it's a delta that has supported large communities of Aboriginal people for millennia. Um, can support up to 4,000, 400,000 birds in the spring and more than a million in, in the autumn. So also a prime range for bison. <coughs> so as a result of some of these attributes, this is a designated Ramsar wetland site and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So I think sometimes people are looking for uh, kind of these, these brands or these rec recognizable um, international uh, kind of awards to sort of justify why we should care about this resource. So we're throwing that in there for context. Now we heard this morning on, uh, by Kim that, you know, the petroleum, oil and gas sector in Alberta is, is just, you know, on the big scheme of things on a provincial-wide basis, a small user of our water um, province-wide. But it is, it is an important consideration to see where we're at today, especially when we think about the growth that is forecasted in the future. Um, so just, you know, on a mining on a per barrel basis, the gross use is about 10 to 12 barrels of, of water per barrel of bitumen produced. And the net is around two to four. So any company that has um, been around for a while, Suncor or St. Crude, they can actually get their, their use down to about two barrels of water per barrel of bitumen produced. Whereas the newer companies have more challenges, and that's because they don't have as, as many tailing spots to draw uh, that recycled water from. So with regard to institute development, we're looking at a lot less, uh, lower intensity water basis. Um, so 0.5 barrels of fresh water or so, and 0.4 barrels of brackish per barrel of bitumen produced. And these are numbers that actually came from the relatively new uh, Government of Alberta Oil Sands Information Portal. So I know uh, Andy mentioned that this morning. It is a fantastic source for information, and if you haven't actually checked it out, I encourage you to do so. Again, just to summarize some of the, the water use um, totals for 2010. Um, sorry, I don't have any uh, up-to-date analogies for you to compare these uses, uses to, but we're looking at about 180 billion liters of water used in 2010 alone. And this is significant because of the potential risks to the Athabasca River. So we know that the summer and winter flows of the Athabasca are declining. They've declined for the last three decades. Um, and that's largely attributed to climate warming, but also um, decreased snow. We've heard a lot about that today. Uh, we're anticipating further declines in the future. And we have already to date, so with licenses um, for just the mining sector alone, um, of up to 652 million cubic meters per year. We know that the, the, the withdrawals from the Athabasca River are largely permanent. And, we're, and I guess the concern is, you know, some, some scientists have said, will the projected bitumen uh, needs, bitumen extraction needs, be actually too much for the Athabasca River to bear? Um, of course, all of these challenges are, and uses are magnified by climate change, and we've heard a little bit about the, the Alberta Fisheries and Oceans Canada framework today, um, thanks to Professor Percy. Uh, it's a graduated framework, um, so we have, you know, different different flow levels on the river, um, companies can draw different, different amounts. But red, unfortunately, is when you know, the ecosystem debate, well, when the ecological integrity of the river is at risk due to low flows. And at that point, industry is still allowed to withdraw water. Uh, so red does not e equal actually stop here, which suggests industry needs to take precedence over the environment. Um, when it comes to challenges with water quality, we you know, we've, we've already uh, heard a lot about the uh, National Academy of Sciences papers that show that there are higher concentrations of polycyclic aromatic compounds, as well as key uh, priority pollutants, uh, so uh, arsenic and lead and other heavy metals downstream of oil sands relative to upstream. Um, sources for this, for these uh, pollutants, uh, when you read the papers, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them, uh, Dr. Aaron Kelly and, and Dr. Schindler, um, is upgrading and surface, run, my, surface mine runoff. Uh, so risk to Aboriginal communities is still relatively unknown. Our Royal Society of Canada report on the oil sands suggested that there is no link between uh, water contaminants and the health of communities downstream. But the same panel also noted that there actually needs to be improvements made to the monitoring system. There's also been a number of concerns about the monitoring system raised as a result of these papers. Uh, so, I mean, it really, it really brought attention to the Regional Aquatics Monitoring Program, or RAMP, 
uh, and the need for that particular body to be examined with more scrutiny. So we've had an Alberta, Alberta provincial panel um, recommend that it needs changes. We've had a federal advisory panel suggest that uh, the monitoring in Alberta needs most particular ramp, uh, lacks scientific rigor and lacks leadership. And, and you know, we have seen some movement there. I'll talk about that when we get to the solution side of things. Tailings are obviously still um, a <clears throat> very hot topic. Uh, interestingly, the, the Kelly study that I just referred to around the uh, heavy metals, um, it, did, it did link some of the heavy metals to uh, locations, proximity to tailings, and the storage of tailings waste. So we're just at about 176 square kilometers right now. That number's a little bit out of date, actually. And we're expecting to see that uh, tailings area to double in about 30 years' time. Um, we know that nephenic acids, which are acutely fatal to, to wildlife, um, are at ha significantly higher concentrations in these ponds as the water is recycled off. <laughs> show it on auto circulate, I think. Um, so again, source of, cons source of methane and, and other um, emissions of concern. And we, we have seen some success with respect to Pond 1. Uh, so Suncor has been able to, to fill and revegetate and done a tremendous job with with its on one uh, reclamation effort. Uh, it's not certified as reclaimed yet by the Alberta government, so we've got a little ways to go until we get to that milestone. Um, and it is important just to remember in terms of the total context in which we're operating, operating here, uh, Suncor's Pond 1 is only about 1% of the total tailings <coughs> area. And these things do seep. <laughs> so um, we, we do know, maybe we do know they seep. I mean, the Royal Society of Canada had done actually a fairly good job at compiling some of the the numbers on seepage. Um, my conversations with folks in government and, and whatnot is that we, there's still a lack of certainty about what is seeping and how much. So again, um, a certain amount of risk there, and, and there is a need for additional clarity, particularly if we're going to see the projected growth in the, in the mining industry. One of the probably more risky aspects of tailings management and reclamation is, is this pictorial of a um, what's called the water capping of, of fine tailings in an end pit lake. And so at the end of mine li life, the proposal is to basically make use of the last dugout mine pit, uh, dump the remaining or excess tailings waste, consolidating tailings waste, whatever they have that, that hasn't already been dealt with through their other reclamation efforts, uh, dump that into the, the dugout mine pit and then cap that with up to 60 meters of, of fresh water from the Athabasca River. Um, this is a long-term permanent proposal that actually has never been demonstrated. Um, the expectation is that this would be a self-sustaining aquatic ecosystem that is safe you know, um, for, for users on the landscape <coughs> and whatnot over time. But it is, it is with its, not without its challenge, challenges. Uh, the Cumulative Environmental Management Association noted that you know, because this has never been actually done before, um, that historical data are insufficient to determine whether or not these will actually be a success. Um, and it, you know, we, we know that NPIT lakes are used in other mining sectors. So, for example, you know, you, it's not atypical for uh, a coal mine or another mining sector to, to use NPIT lakes to just dump water and create a lake. But what's unique about NPIT lakes and the, their use for tailings management and reclamation in the oil sands is that we are talking about the deposition of tailings waste at the bottom of them. And really, this, this state of marrow mixes, where the freshwater layer does not mix with the tailings waste layer, that actually has not um, yet been, been proven. And it is really a, let's cross fingers and hope it works. Uh, Syncrude, to its merit, I and mean, they are uh, testing this. They have a demonstration project called Base Mine Lake. They are hoping to, to uh, I guess, unveil the success of Base Mine Lake in 2012 this year. Um, but again, a, a number of concerns. Will these be self-sustaining? Will it require, will these input lakes require active or, or passive management? Um, there's about 20, 26 or 27 of them proposed currently in northeastern Alberta. So a significant concern to those who are actually living in the region because eventually these lakes will be released back into the environment and connected up with the other systems. Um, in 2009, the Pemmican Institute was thrilled to, to uh, hear about the launch of Directive 74, or the release of these new tailings regulations. Um, it is definitely a, a great step in, in the right direction, and 
what you know remains to be done is still some rules around the legacy tellings that are on, on the landscape today. Um, and we were we were initially quite hopeful about this this directive in terms of its ability to reduce or limit a portion of future tailings growth. It's, a, it's an intensity um, type of regulation, much like our carbon regulations are in the province for large emitters. Um, but you know, unfortunately, seven out of the nine plans that were submitted were actually not in compliance with Directive 74. And the government of Alberta and the Energy Resources Conservation Board has decided to uh, make the, the directive and a flexible approach to uh, to compliance. So that's disappointing, but we are looking forward to hearing more about uh, tail tailings management criteria actually this year. Thinking about uh, the downstream concerns, having lived in, in Yellowknife uh, for, for over a year, it was a pretty fascinating experience to talk to people in the <coughs> north about the oil sands. Amazing amount of knowledge and, and actually a lot of concern. As we know, um, as the Athabasca River flows north um, into the delta and then into Lake Athabasca, it eventually flows to the Slave and onto the Mackenzie, which ends up in the Arctic Ocean. So in those three red dots, you can see the farther southern dot is Fort McMurray, then the next one is Yellowknife, and then to the north is actually the community of Fort Good Hope, where I was actually visiting folks talking about the oil sands, and they had a lot of questions and a lot of concerns to the point where the 33 communities actually in the Northwest Territories have actually signed a uh, resolution for um, calling on a moratorium for any new development until um, they have a better understanding of, of the impacts, but also until they can get a secure transboundary agreement in place between the province of Alberta and the territory. Uh, risks of ground, groundwater are actually um, somewhat, I feel like not, they're not getting the same credit that they potentially deserve. Uh, Water Matters is a, is a fantastic Alberta-based organization that's done a lot to unveil some of the uncertainties and risks associated with groundwater use in the oil sands. Um, there's, there's a number of uncertainties that groundwater is the primary use of water for, or the primary source of water for in-situ development. Uh, but some, just a couple of the uncertainties that I'm going to talk about today are, you know, how low flows in the Athabasca River are affecting shallow groundwater and vice versa. How will the deep injection of, of waste and desalinization of, of brackish water actually impact aquifer systems. Um, and, and just again, a total uh, lack of knowledge in terms of what that threshold is to ensure responsible groundwater use. So uh, the need to define a sustainable yield there is, is quite key. And I, I think it's important to just recognize that mining is about, makes up about 54% of the total oil sands production right now. It's typically been the dominant form of oil sands development for the last 45 years or so. We are going to see in-situ development take over from mining in about five years' time, according to the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. And so with that is obviously increased risk of groundwater, but also increased risk of cumulative effects. So you can see the, the orange region to the north is the mineable area, and then that much larger, lighter orange region is all of the, the in-situ deposits. So 30 times as large, uh, as the mineable region, and we've already leased over 80,000 square kilometers. Of course, in Alberta, we don't we don't conduct environmental assessments or consult First Nations prior to the leasing of, of uh, uh, mineral rights. We've <coughs> monitoring has been in the in the news quite a bit, and we've actually seen some success in the last year. Again, the the work of Aaron Kelly and David Schindler, as well as some of the panel reports that came out from both provincial and federal governments did a lot at shedding, did a lot for shedding light on some of the concerns and challenges that our current monitoring system had had in the region. Um, last summer, the, the federal government released some very uh, strong implementation plans for air biodiversity and water and monitoring of those, those key components. And then in just February of this year, those plans were rolled up into an implementation plan with the province, uh, and they have released a joint plan for oil sands monitoring. A couple of outstanding concerns remain for, for, for me personally. I think just you know how how are the projects that are in the regulatory queue right now? So we're, we're anticipating a couple of public hearings potentially on the large oil sands mines in 2012 or early 2013. Those those projects and environmental impact assessments are basing their data on older monitoring information. So monitoring information has now been deemed relatively 
lacking in, in scientific rigor or just not credible. So how are those proponents <laughs> and the regulators actually going to address those challenges that have been expressed by a number of different independent groups and governments um, in the approval process? And then when will actually the, the plan that was announced in February of this year, when will that be rolled out? When will it be collecting credible information? And when will that information actually link back to decision making? So again, we just we just need more information, and I think they are working hard on it. So we look forward to learning more. Um, <coughs> big picture, probably one of the key concerns for, for the Pembina Institute is the pace and scale of development and the absence of, of key environmental limits. So I think it's always interesting to think back in the early or mid 1990s when we only had about three to 300 to 400,000 barrels coming out of the oil sands per day. And it was at that time when a group of industry and government uh, representatives came together to, to form the National Oil Sands Task Force. And their goal was to rebrand what was then called the tar sands to, to the oil sands and really to sell it as Canada's national prize. And so they put it in a number of fiscal measures and incentives to, invest, to really drive investment in the region. And their goal was to have one million barrels coming out of the oil sands per day by 2020. Well, as we all know, we met that goal well ahead of schedule in 2004, so 16 years ahead of schedule. And so unfortunately, the, you know, the particular task force and associated government bodies that also had plans to put in place, hopefully, an adequate monitoring regime to help manage the impacts. Well, that never got done. And so we're continually still playing catch up with that in that regard. Um, looking at the status of, of production today, we're at about 1.6 to 1.7 million barrels per day coming out of the oil sands in, in 20, 2011. Um, we have the operating capacity or operating approval of about 1.9 million barrels per day. When we add on to that the projects that are either in construction or have been approved by our regulators, not yet um, begun construction but approved, we're already a doubling. We're over 4 million barrels per day. Um, the NEB projects that we'll likely have around 5 million barrels per day National Energy Board's uh, Energy Futures Report, about 5 million barrels per day in 2035, just put kind of a timeline on this. Um, and then when we look at the projects that are either an application disclosure or um, that have just been announced, we're, we're exceeding over 8 million barrels per day. So again, any incremental improvement that, that a company might be doing on its own accord, a company that wants to demonstrate leadership, may actually just be trumped by the sheer pace and scale of, of growth. And here's just a, a pictorial look at kind of you know, what, what the 2006 lease sales would look like if they were developed all at one time. So this was a satellite image using Google Earth. Um, you can see to the north the tailings ponds um, that look rather blue and swimmable on a sunny day. Um, and, and so what we did is we just projected using a pretty conservative footprint for an in-situ project. We used the Optimexing project. We projected that based on the lease sales in 2006 just to get a sense of what the footprint would look like in the future. And we know that reclamation hasn't actually kept pace with the, with the scale of development, but again, keep in mind that this is assuming there's very little reclamation. So this is the footprint of, of just a portion of the region. You can see all of the fragmentation in you know, the majority of the region as a result of in-situ development. And then that, that strip mined region is completely blanked out to the north. Um, and it, you know, it's not just the Pembina Institute and other, other ENGOs who are, are raising concerns about uh, pace and scale and just the regulatory capacity. It's also the Royal Society of Canada who noted you know, that we haven't, haven't actually been able to catch up with that million barrels per day goal. Uh, the Pembina Institute, in one of our more recent reports, um, tried to you know, pull from the 18 or so years of experience that we had at the time a number of the key uh, solutions that we think are have merit and can really help address the management management concerns in the region in a report called Solving the Puzzle, Environmental Responsibility in Oil Sands Development. And so I'm just going to talk quickly about some of the solutions we pitched for water in this report. We, we also look at land and air. <coughs> um, so again, on the, on the water use or quantity side of things, establishing an ecosystem-based flow or a point in which uh, industrial withdrawals are actually stopped when the flows are low um, would be a solution. The Miccosu uh, Creek First Nation actually contracted work um, 
and did their own study, and they proposed a cutoff point at 100 cubic meters per second. So, I mean, there's there's some numbers that have been floating around out there. There's 80, that one another number that was uh, pitched was 87 cubic meters per second. So there's definitely conversation about doing this. It's just a matter of um, getting to that final step and implementing it. Uh, to protect groundwater, to really complete the mapping that started, but again, we're still unclear about what a sustainable yield for groundwater is. So identifying and implementing and enforcing the sustainable yield concept for groundwater. Uh, when it comes to tailings, we know that there, I think I used to get probably five phone calls a week from, from you know, budding engineers and, and tech whizzes who have the solution for tailings management. So there is a lot of research going into this, not only within Alberta, but outside of, outside of Canada. Um, and so providing some additional regulatory incentives for companies to address tailings waste so they're not having to rely on, on uh, untested reclamation strategies for the future um, would be very much uh, needed. And so we, you know, as part of that recommendation, we do suggest that my applications that propose using infant lakes as, as waste dumps for tailings not be, not be approved because there are alternatives and you know, Suncor invested over a billion dollars in its tailings reductions operations um, and they have, you know, they have some pretty ambitious goals to, to address their tailings challenges. We would hope that other companies would follow suit, but again, um, we need also government to, to uh, put their appropriate regulations in place to really drive that kind of change. Um, with regards to monitoring, and we've, we've seen some monitoring progress, so we have a joint plan released. Um, but we want to make sure that some of the more problematic monitoring bodies are disbanded and that we can then ensure Albertans trust the system that is in place. And we'd like to see a long-term commitment to actually resourcing that, an adequate monitoring system. Again, the resourcing side of the question in terms of monitoring is still a bit fuzzy. I think it makes sense to have an industry, probably industry slash uh, government funded program. And I'll, I'll end it there. I would love to hear any questions if I'm not talking about any folks from getting to their first drink. See ya. Let's just start. What's the feeling about the sure. So the question is regarding the, uh, the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. So it's, uh, it's the new 12 company body. Um, and I, I was chatting with uh, Cord Lambert about it, and he called it OSLI, the Oil Sands Leadership Initiative on Steroids. So um, it's, it's, you know, it's going to take over my understanding of, of OSLI, and um, I think we remain cautiously optimistic. Again, until we actually see things roll out and maybe a sense of timing and deliverables, it's hard to judge. But um, the fact that that many companies have come together and decided to share what was formerly considered proprietary information is, is very encouraging. Jennifer, um, at the beginning of your talk, you said that you roughly expect the number of the area covered by tailings ponds to double in 30 years, and then you had your recommendation about no approvals. But it seems to me the last two years I've heard from regulators, oil companies, and informed observers, <coughs> within five years there will be no new tailings ponds. Is that something that, and therefore that doubling will not happen, is that something that you would hear through reasonably credible sources? So our information to propose that doubling figure is actually coming from the tailings plan, the tailing, tailings plans that were submitted by companies to comply with Directive 74. So we actually have a whole report that compiles those plans, provides that analysis, and, and a, the most recent paper I've seen on, on projected tailings growth was actually, um, it was at a conference last fall, uh, Richard Houlihan, who is with the Energy Resources Conservation Board and one of the chief tailings engineers, he actually has similar numbers to us. And so I, I, I haven't actually been able to substantiate the claim that things are going to be <laughs> drastically up in five years' time. But we have also heard that there are new um, elements of an overarching tailings framework being released in 2012. So what you are hearing may be um, a sneak preview to what's coming. But currently, the current regulations don't allow for that. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you very yeah, much for your attention.